Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. I have a few additions to our agenda for this month, as well as some uh, public comments that are ongoing that I'd like to announce. First, uh, and actually to start as, a, as an update, um, I wanted to let folks know that on Monday, uh, June 13th, we had our General Advisory Committee meeting. And at that meeting, uh, we discussed the hospital sustainability report that the board uh, did for the legislature and also um, reviewed Act 167, which was S-285. That became law recently. Uh, I'd, I'd just put a plug in for folks who are interested in coming up to speed on the work that the board has done on hospital sustainability and now the uh, new legislation coming out of uh, the legislature, Act 167. It's a really good update and most um, important is the comments from the advisory. They were incredibly helpful. Um, we were, we were um, honored to be um, joined by uh, some folks from AHS as well. So they were listening in on the conversation. And of course, we've shared that feedback with them as we are collaborating closely on Act 167 with the Agency of Human Services. So that's really a plug on a, a great meeting and a, and a thank you to our General Advisory Committee members. I also wanted to announce that tonight, the primary care advisory group will be meeting and that starts at 5.30 via Teams. And now I'll just review uh, the open public comments just to remind folks if they want to comment in, on any of these items before the board. First, the board is currently accepting public comment on the Vermont Information Technology Leaders Vitals budget. This was presented to the board on June 8th. Uh, we'd ask that you submit public comment before close of business on June 17th so that it could be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board staff pre presentation and potential vote scheduled for next week, June 22nd. The board is also um, currently reviewing the FY23 Accountable Care Organization budget guidance and certification form. The Medicare only ACO guidance was reviewed uh, last week at the board meeting. And then this, um, this week, the certified ACO guidance and certification form uh, will be reviewed for, with the board. Materials can be found on our website. And then also we ask that folks comment by close of business June 20th in order for the board to consider those comments before its potential vote next Wednesday. On Friday, May 6th, the board received and began its review of the proposed rates for major medical health insurance plans offered to individuals, families, and small businesses in Vermont uh, in 2023, including plans offered on, the Vermont, on Vermont Health Connect the board is accepting public comment on these filings. Uh, we open this comment period on Monday, May 9th, and it will go until July 21st at 11.59 p.m. The comments may be submitted electronically through the rate review website on the Green Mountain Care Board website by email to gmcb.board at vermont.gov by U.S. mail to the GMCB at 144 State Street in Montpelier, or by phone at 802-828-2177. All of this information is on our website, and um, please uh, submit comments on those very important plans. And then last, but certainly not least, the board uh, has an ongoing public comment period regarding a potential next all-pair model agreement with the federal government. Um, we'd ask that you'd share those with the board and that we will share those with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the next model. And that is all I have to announce and report out today. Chair Mullen, back to you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 8th. 
Do I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 8th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please uh, do so by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. And at this point, Susan, I'm going to throw it back to you to tee up the discussion on the UVM Health Network mental health integration. So, Susan. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Just uh, I wanted to give a little background before I turn it over to the folks at UVMHN. So um, I wanted to, um, I actually was the one who asked, and of course worked with uh, Chair Mullen and asked uh, the UVMHN folks to come before the board. I had seen this presentation given at the Mental Health Integration Council meeting a couple of months ago. Um, just by way of background, the Mental Health Integration Council is a statutorily prescribed uh, group that the Department of Mental Health is running. Um, it's an excellent um, um, group that, that that is trying, and it's a real, real large mandate, but to try to integrate mental health um, into primary care and and all sorts of care within within our healthcare system. So um, I heard this presentation. I thought it would be really helpful for the board to hear this presentation and also the general public. And it's um, it's it, you know the the work that UVM UVMHN is doing in terms of their mental health integration in primary care. So I will turn this over um, I, we have Dr. Brumstead, um, we have Dr. Sarah Pulowski, and we have Clara Keegan, I believe, and then also Maureen Leahy, who will be presenting to us. And I'm thinking I'll turn it to you, Dr. Brumstead, to introduce your team. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll uh, um, let each of the team members introduce themselves when we get there like to uh, thank the, the board for their time and Susan for your interest. This is great work and my job is to set some context and then quickly get out of the way so that uh, our experts can uh, appropriately strut their stuff. They've done, done great work. So the context uh, is in 2018, early in 2018, um, I asked um, uh, Dr. Bob Peratini, uh, assisted by Eric Miller, to look inside of the UVM Health Network and to develop a mental health strategic plan. So knowing that there's a whole world of folks in um, uh, mental health uh, and resources that we need to work with, but this was more what can we as UVM Health Network what should we be doing and what can we be doing to meet the needs of this uh, population um, and um, you know, get specific. And the recommendations that came out of that were to um, uh, work on increasing the number of adult inpatient beds. Um, at Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital uh, in Plattsburgh, uh, we have a child and adolescent unit. So at that time, uh, it was not well staffed. And so to fully staff that and get that up to speed, and I'm happy to say we were able to accomplish that, and to engage in any other partners in the broader community that were working on increasing access for child uh, and adolescent uh, psychiatric or mental health needs. Um, and I believe we've done some of that. Um, and to today, um, integrate mental health services into primary care in a way that's more than just the window dressing of uh, having a mental health clinician pass through a primary care office periodically. Um, all of these recommendations were driven by needs in our community. Uh, you all know that uh, some of these things have been disrupted by the uh, uh, pandemic uh, that we've been uh, experiencing. Um, I would say that this is all born on what 
the right thing to do for our patients are to meet their needs and to meet our mission as a not-for-profit healthcare delivery system. But um, uh, providing these services and this degree of integration in primary care very tightly ties with uh, our foundational strategy to move towards value-based care in a value-based reimbursement model and a way for fee-for-service. So it serves both of our uh, uh, foundational strategies of meeting the needs of uh, our patients and our communities, but also to move uh, to a business model that supports that. And I think you'll hear about that in uh, in spades. So we have Drs. Keegan and Polowski and uh, Maureen Leahy who will be um, providing you the information. And I believe we have uh, uh, Jen Collis, who's going to provide the, the slides. But Maureen, am I pitching this to you or Sarah? Who's going to take over? I think I'll take it over from here. Okay, great. So I'll give a brief introduction. I'm Maureen Leahy. I am the Administrative Director for the Neurology and Psychiatry Departments here at UVM Health Network. And I am the Administrative Lead for this project implementation. And I'll let Dr. Pulaski introduce herself. Hi, I'm Sarah Pulowski. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I've been in Vermont for about 10 years. Um, after medical school, I came here for my training and residency and my fellowship, and I've worked across many mental health settings at this point. I have um, trained in the emergency room and then worked there as an attending, inpatient services, outpatient, um, and crisis outreach. So. I'm very aware of all of the access challenges we have, and I'm so happy to be doing this integrated work that's um, meant to address some of those challenges. And, and I'll just add for a personal note, um, I am a provider for psychiatry, but I also um, love someone who um, has been in need of services. So I have a very um, deep kind of emotional bond to this work. So I'm just always so thrilled to talk about it and happy you wanna hear more. So thank you for having us all. And I'm Claire Keegan. I'm a family physician. I've been at the University of Vermont for 11 years now, and I'm the primary care champion for the PCMHI project. And um, uh, I'll take it from here at this point. So um, the introductions actually are sort of the first uh, key to the success of this implementation. It's bringing together psychiatry and primary care in a room or a, a Zoom, or a virtual room together and um, understanding um, how to develop what is a good working relationship into a, a true collaboration. Um, next slide, please. So we are going to share with you um, today, um, really to quantify a little bit, um, some information around the demand. I know everybody knows there's a significant demand, but we wanted to put some um, some numbers and um, illustrate it a little bit more concretely. Um, we're going to also talk about the collaborative care model that we're working on implementing, and then we'll tell you about where we're taking this. Ha we are absolutely um, willing and happy to answer any questions that come up along the way um, or uh, afterwards. I'm not sure of your format. Uh, next slide. So um, this is some national information. So um, there's two elements going on on this slide here. So first of all, I'm gonna speak to the Im image on the right-hand side. Um, so nationally, uh, we know that um, there is an unmet need for non-prescribing providers. So we have about 20% of the non-prescribing providers nationally that we need for mental health care. And the non-prescribing providers are people like psychologists, uh, social workers, mental health clinicians, uh, alcohol drug counselors, um, that whole category of uh, provider. And then we know um, additionally that there is a 96% unmet need for prescribers. So um, and again, in that category, we have our physician psychiatrists, we have um, nurse practitioners and PAs who are psychiatrically trained. Um, and so there's a significant void or, or gap in the amount of providers that we would need to treat the population of people who have mental uh, health problems. We also know um, that people who um, live or struggle with mental health problems 
um, statistically don't follow through at the same rate as people who don't have mental health problems. And so um, oftentimes when we start somebody in a plan of care, uh, unless we are providing, uh, I'll say, appropriate handholding or appropriate supports, um, they may not follow through with that plan of care, um, which then uh, can cause the outcomes to, de to deteriorate. Next slide. Um, uh, this is so, sort of more painting the picture of where we are. So we know that about one in four adults and almost one in two uh, children have a mental health diagnosis. Um, that These numbers uh, we pulled were from pre-pandemic, so I expect these numbers are likely higher now, um, given the impact the pandemic has had on, on the population. But even pre-pandemic, these are really staggering numbers um, to, to think about serving. Um, we also sort of have brought this locally and can tell you that about 30 percent of our adult um, primary care patients have a mental health diagnosis and 58 percent of our ED patients, emergency department patients, have a um, mental health diagnosis. So um, what we're seeing nationally is, is absolutely repl replicated here uh, locally. Um, uh, when somebody has a mental health condition, we see a, a mean reduction in their life expectancy of about 10 years. And we know that they cost the system about two and a half times as the equivalent patient without the mental health condition. Um, so to illustrate that, somebody who has diabetes um, and depression costs the system approximately two and a half times as the person who has only diabetes. And so um, this really speaks to the need to, for, for clinical outcomes to address this problem, but also um, when we're looking at how to reduce the total cost of care of, of a patient or of a population, um, not addressing their mental health conditions has a significant financial impact. Um, and by using the historic model that we've used where we add um, outpatient psychiatrists who see a panel of, you know, 100 sick patients, um, all we're doing is causing a bottleneck to continue, um, and it's not efficient and it's not effective. Next slide. So now I'm going to hand off to Dr. Pulaski to tell us about the model. Thank you. Um, so I was asked to give a little bit of context on the history of collaborative care because now it's it's really seen as a um, an evidence based model that improves outcomes and access, but it has a, a real historical um, kind of a set of uh, reasons that we we kind of went in this direction. And so I think in the 80s or 90s there was a recognition that more and more people were being seen for depression, particularly in primary care. Um, and there's an older statistic that about 60% of people with mental health um, problems may be seen in primary care and not by a psychiatrist like myself. So this is where we really had this seismic shift um, in the perception that mental health care is, is delivered more by psychiatrists such as me, that we could train people in primary care and also further support people and patients in primary care. And then throughout the 2000s, there was um, really the beginning of the research into this idea, and it created this robust evidence base of about 80 to now 90 randomized control trials that show the effectiveness of collaborative care amongst several aims that um, Maureen has already mentioned. And now we're really in this era where um, many uh, healthcare systems such as ours are working on implementing these models and sustaining these models and furthering the reach of these models. Next slide, please. So that was kind of a broader um, historical overview, but these are the core components of collaborative care. And I think um, there are really some core differences in how this compares to maybe more traditional psychiatry um, and um, mental health care. And it's really the addition of two core key members within the primary care teams. One is a care manager who serves several different functions, and the other is someone like myself, a psychiatric consultant. 
And the care manager works a bit differently than um, maybe a classic kind of care manager. They um, serve the population, but they do so by using a registry, which is um, kind of capturing all of these different data points um, within primary care and looking at certain particular screening measures, um, utilization patterns, and then trying to target interventions um, for people who really need them within primary care, within their office, versus referring them out to work with someone. And then they're also trained in very particular types of psychotherapy, which um, are correlated with very good outcomes, such as cognitive behavioral therapy and um, thinking as a psychiatrist, having that offered within primary care and having that immediate access without referring out is really crucial to the treatment of so many different conditions. And then the psychiatric consultant works very differently than kind of a classic psychiatrist. Um, their role is really on education and training of primary care providers to do this work, um, to for oversight of the care manager, um, and to provide recommendations, not always in that kind of, um, you know, direct patient care way, but through e-consults, um, through reviews of charts, through case discussions, um, and then reserving the um, time in which they spend directly with a patient um, for some patients who are um, really more um, deemed appropriate to be seen by a psychiatrist and for whom that could really be beneficial for them. So it's providing care very differently than a psychiatrist who may have, as Maureen said, a panel of, you know, a few patients whom they give, you know, care to and see over a course of a very long time, regardless of their state of illness, to trying to have a well-timed um, kind of well uh, well thought out um, interventions with the psychiatrist as well. So it's really a different way of supporting um, patients in, in primary care. Next slide, please. Um, so this is an example of the continuum of care. Of course, this kind of model of care is part of a whole array of services. And the idea is that in collaborative care models, we have with more coordination and a focus on moving people through um, our system in more of a thoughtful way. Um, and that also plays into how we've decided to do this model here. So that's the next slide, please. So this is um, what we are doing now, which I think this kind of slide shows um, really a model of care that looks a lot like the hub and spoke model for substance use disorder care. Um, and I think similarly and historically, the idea of substance use treatment wasn't necessarily the provision of primary care, um, but was also within kind of specialty, maybe addiction medicine treatment clinics. But the broadening of kind of the resources um, has helped many more people have access. And then the use of MAT teams has also helped people, um, you know, remain in their medical home for a lot of this care. And so what we're trying to do and what we are currently doing in our structure is having um, a primary care mental health integration team embedded in primary care, but having some um, ability to uh, connect people through specialty services, which is our primary care mental health and um, extension group, who can provide more services um, in kind of a more ongoing way. And the idea is that there's some additional fluidity between these kind of uh, services that serves overall the more people in the population than that kind of um, uh, caseload holding model that's more traditional in psychiatry. Next slide, please. And then I'll pass this on to Dr. Keegan. So as a primary care provider, we introduce the idea to our patients. If we see somebody whom we think would be appropriate for working with the behavioral health care manager, we mention them as a member of our team and ask if we would be able to make that referral so that they can work together. We communicate back and forth with our care manager about the patient's care and the, the um, psychiatrist as well. And we're able to ask them specific questions. So if I have a patient who I've been treating with medication, but they're not getting better or they're having side effects or something else comes up, I can get help from the psychiatrist about how to adjust those medications without the patient needing to have an appointment with psychiatry. 
Um, we also are hoping that this will provide additional training for primary care providers to make more of us more comfortable with managing basic mental health measures. We have resources for primary care providers to do the assessment like the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 are two of the, the scales that we use to measure the severity of people's uh, depression and anxiety. And with that support from the psychiatrist, we're able to really work at the best evidence in terms of the medications that we're, that we're providing. The suicide risk is something that we're working on developing as well. We have some tools within our electronic health record that help us assess suicide risk and help us develop a safety plan for patients. And that's something that we're working to teach the primary care providers as well. We can go to the next slide. So we're hoping that by implementing this model, we're going to be seeing specifically less depression, hopefully less physical pain, and generally seeing people do better. This is what the Ames model uh, out of the University of Washington has demonstrated, and we're hoping that we'll be able to replicate that at uh, University of Vermont as well. Maureen, did you have something else to say about this slide? Yeah, so um, when we were going through the when we were going through the process of implementing the project or the developing the implementation, I guess, um, we did a literature search uh, for programs, and there were about eight different um, mental health integration programs that we studied, um, and they were from all across the nation. And you know, we had Intermountain, Ames, and Diamond, and Montefiore, and Cherokee. Um, and when we were studying the programs, the things we were looking for were um, uh, full age span implementation. We were looking for models that showed both financial and clinical outcomes. Um, models that we felt we could replicate knowing what we know about Vermont's mental health system and that would give us access to their tools. Um, and initially, um, we used, uh, we partnered with Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City. Um, they, however, part of their package was purchasing a software tool. Um, and we're not in a position to do it now. We certainly weren't in a position when we were rolling out Epic um, to be buying a bolt-on software tool. And so we switched gears and we went with um, the University of Washington Ames program. Um, it is good to note that um, Intermountain's implementation is based on the Ames model. So they are an Ames implementation. Um, and so when we switched to the Ames model, we all of a sudden got access to everything they have. So we have job descriptions. We have, you know, we have access to them twice a month for financial advice and operational advice. Um, we've got they have a whole website with uh, many of the graphics you've seen in the slide deck are from their their tool set. Um, and so when Dr. Keegan talks about the outcomes we ex we hope to see or we expect to see, um, they're based on those implementations. So we know. Um, the success that AIMS personally or, or specifically has had, and then we know the, the success that the people who have implemented their programs have had. And so that's really the evidence base that Dr. Pulowski references and um, that we expect to see based on the investment that we're making. And I think you can go to the next slide. So where we are right now, so we, um, we spent a lot of time presenting this project to various levels of leadership within our network um, and um, got feedback. We involved all kinds of um, different roles and, and um, leadership. And universally, the idea of this implementation was accepted, I would say, by everybody. Um, nobody that we encountered, we didn't have to pitch the idea of mental health integration to anybody. Um, what we really had to do was say, here's how we're going to do it, and here's what we're um, what we're using to show that we can um, we can do this, what it's going to look like, and how we can pay for it. Um, so those were really the things we focused on. But universally, everybody we encountered at the health network um, was supportive of the concept. Um, our next steps, um, we are, we're partway through implementation. So we have been, we have implemented in a few sites. So, um, we have 38, uh, primary care sites in the network and they range from about 10,000, um, patient 
lives or, or panel members um, down to a, about a thousand. So we have some pretty small ones um, on the New York side of the lake. And so our next steps are recruiting. So we have done, we've spent the last about two years recruiting psychiatrists, social workers, um, and psychologists to uh, help us with this implementation. And we've started to place them at various clinics. Um, we did deliberately start on the Vermont side of the lake because, um, for many reasons, but primarily because when we look at um, the value-based population we have, or the value-based payer population we have, it is more heavily on Ver the Mar Vermont side of the lake. And this is a model that financially works better with a value-based payer model. Um, and as we are, so so we've got, we've got recruiting going, and then we've got the hard work of culture change. So we are coming into people's clinics and saying, here's a psychiatrist, but we want you to use them in maybe a different way than you learned to in medical school or in residency. And so there's a, a, a big lift around changing the culture of care um, in each clinic. Um, I did put down on the list here that, um, you know, the, the importance of continuing the rollout and finding a non-network partner to test this with. with. Um, we are able to, we are a health system, clearly, and we are able to invest in mental health services knowing that we see downstream effect in reduction of ED visits, reduction of inpatient admissions, average length of stay. Um, I would, you know, I would love to find somebody to explore how this looks or how this works financially in a sort of, I'll say, a standalone um, provider of care um, who, do, who can't necessarily rely on the downstream effect. Uh, next slide. And then um, this is sort of a, a, a graphic of where we are. So um, we have nine practices that are currently um, have people on site providing this care. Um, we have at the start of a registry that we're using. So our EPIC team is building a registry for us that will allow us to track patient level data, practice level data, uh, provider level data, and it will be what allows us to look at the program and say it's working, it's not working, we need to tweak, tweak it. Um, the service options we're able to provide with this are medication management, like Dr. Keegan mentioned, um, diagnostic clarity uh, for some of the more complicated patients that we're seeing, um, and then panel management so that if we see um, triggers of things that we might think are suggestive of a mental health problem, um, we might be able to catch those people before they escalate to a point of crisis or an ED admission. Um, and then the last sort of corner over there talks about the type of the providers of the psychiatrists and the case managers that Dr. Pulaski mentioned. Um, clearly, we have got, if I do the math, um, 38 minus 9, you know, 29 more clinics to go. Plus, we still have to tune these ones up a little bit, but um, we are well underway, and it's really exciting work um, to see. When we started this, I, when I was looking back at the slide deck that we had, um, the slide deck that the last presentation internally we did of this was February of 2020. And so then March hit, and we all went full swing pandemic. And I think I, I feel one of the most impressive things is that we've continued this work. So in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of you know financial struggles, in the midst of um, all kinds of curveballs, this work has continued, has continued to be supported by everybody I've encountered um, and has retained a sense of priority um, when um, a lot of things may, you know, you, when, when, when we've all had to rethink what our priorities are. So I think that speaks to the importance of the work. Next slide. So Dr. Keegan, Dr. Pulaski and I um, get our 60 minutes of fame here, but um, there have been a ton of people involved in this work. And when we look at this list of people, um, what you see are um, physicians, we see social workers, we see administrators. Um, we also have um, psychiatry represented, primary care. Uh, Dr. Weinberger is our uh, pediatric primary care physician. Um, it, it really should be probably bolded or, or, or some other way to make it stand out is the primary care providers because we're really asking them to change one more thing in the context of um, 
you know, a lot of activity in their worlds. And so, um, you know, our, uh, we, we would, we would not have made it nearly this far without the support of this group. And so I think that uh, ends our formal presentation, but we're uh, clearly here to answer whatever questions have come up for people. Super, thank you very much and very informative. I'll open it up for the board's uh, questions. I'll start. Um, thank you, Kevin, and thank you so much for the presentation. Really, really informative, very inspiring. Uh, I can't wait to see how it scales up and the impact that it has. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering um, how long do you contract with AIMS for? Is it an indefinite you know, kind of contract? Is it just to set you off to launch? And then I guess a quick follow up to that is, are there opportunities to pivot or incorporate best practices from you know other programs like Intermountain or are you kind of wed to this one model? Um, with this contract? So we actually don't have a contract. This okay. is a, a, a friendly agreement. Um, we okay. show up, we ask them questions. Uh, we have, they have all of their product is for public use on their websites. Um, we did bring out um, Dr. Anna Ratzliff, who is one of the architects of the Ames model, um, out for a Grand Rounds presentation and had a couple of different opportunities to bounce questions and ideas off of her. But we don't actually have a formal contract with them. Um, we internally have decided this is the model we want to use. Theoretically, if it doesn't fit Vermont, we could pivot to a different direct in, in a different direction. Got it. Great. And I guess my second question is really around um, lessons you've learned from the culture change, which I imagine is challenging. And I'm just wondering, are there lessons that you've learned here that apply to, first of all, you know, the, the clinics that you haven't been to yet? Are you, you know, in the implementation there, but also to other types of delivery reform efforts that might be coming down the pipeline? Like, it sounds like you've done a lot of work on culture change, and I'm wondering what some of the learnings are there. Um. I think for me, so probably one of the biggest first learnings was I was super excited, still am, about this thing that I'm offering, and it didn't necessarily exactly match the immediate need of the primary care provider in front of them. So uh, we're talking about population health and panel management and con controlling or treating a population of patients, and the primary care provider has the patient in their office, you know, in some sort of crisis or dis, uh, despair, and they they want that taken care of right now. And so we, we had to sort of change our approach a little bit of um, setting what kind of expectations people could um, expect and trying to help them see, sort of see the long game of this. So this, so this is, um, so that was probably the first biggest thing that I learned. Um, Sarah, do you have any? Yeah, um, I was just thinking about um, how big of a shift of care delivery this is, and that's probably across the board for every provider um, involved in the patient as well. Um, and I can speak for the psychiatrists where this is so different than having a set of patients whom you see for many, many years. And so the orientation around it is about you know, how can I be a resource in a really different and kind of creative way to a practice? Um, and I think that's a, it's a, it's something that I, I think I, I, I didn't fully appreciate until we recruited more people into this work about um, just how it's a, it's a different way of being a psychiatrist. And in many ways, it's a different way of um, being a patient to have an e-consult versus um, a direct face-to-face uh, time with me, um, or, you know, it's a different way of being a primary care provider as well, which um, I think Dr. Keegan can speak to too. So um, I, I think I appreciate more just the level of adaptation and, and I'm very appreciative that we have this um, kind of ongoing team and, and so much support in doing this work. Yeah, it definitely takes a, a different um... It requires a different approach to asking for help. I think a lot of us we, we see people with a lot of concerns in the same visit that we're trying to manage. So if I see someone for a physical and they bring a list of their concerns, their knee pain and their irregular vaginal bleeding, and they're also depressed, 
we all have different levels of what we're used to managing ourselves and what, 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 what we want to just refer and ask for help with. And the big challenge, I think, is that we don't have enough psychiatrists to refer everyone with a mood disorder to psychiatry. So we've needed to continually do re-education that, you no, know, this is for our advanced practice providers and for physicians as well, that this is something you can handle. We're going to give you some backup and support, uh, but we need to ask you to be the prescriber for this medication and let's show you how it's a safe thing that you can do and you can prescribe. Um, and maybe next time you will manage the depression and refer the knee pain. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely a change to, to also to, to say to the patient, I have a team member that I'd like to work with you. Um, it's not a psychiatrist, it's a care manager and they're going to help you feel better while we're waiting for the medicine to work. And then also we have to have language about, I'm gonna ask for help from my psychiatry colleague who's gonna review the information that I put in the note and get back to me and then I'll let you know what they suggest rather than an actual visit with the psychiatrist, which uh, sometimes is what patients are expecting. So we need to do a lot of management of expectations and that's a work in progress. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this and it's inspiring work that you're all doing. Okay, other questions or comments from board members? So this is this is Tom Walsh. Um, like Jess, I just want to thank you for all that you're doing. Um, no real questions, but I, I can I want to second the um, the difficulty that you're talking about with culture change. Um, when I was practicing clinically a long time ago now, we started using a depression and anxiety screening tool for patients who are coming to our chronic pain clinic. And we expected, based on the tool, to have a small number of patients with a positive score, right? And it was over 10 times as high once we started seeing, and this was this is back in the late 1990s. So the, the need was there, unrealized need was there long back then. And we, we started looking at, of the patients who were um, testing positive on the screening tool, what proportion of those patients were referred to the psychologist that we had on staff in the same hallway. We built the center with an embedded psychologist. And it was less than 10% in the beginning. And we were, you know, we were smacking our forehead, like we designed for this. There's a bigger need for it than we imagined, but we couldn't get the referral mechanisms and the culture, the, the neurosurgeons talking about psychology. We couldn't get that to work. It, it took about three years to get the process where um, over 75% of the patients with a positive screen were seen by one of the behavioral therapist staff. And two of the things that we found that were most helpful with that, um, patients were filling out the surveys on a computer, it was scored automatically, and that with those scores were provided to the clinicians at the point of care. But we, we had one of our computer people write a little bit of code that if the test was positive, text the psychologist to then go see that patient right then. Just very briefly, thanks for filling this out. It helps us treat you better. I wanna know more about this score and how can we set up something following this visit um, for your back pain, All right? So, so we, we got the, the clinician who could address the positive score face to face with the patient before I as a physical therapist could screw it up or the neurosurgeon could screw it up. We just got the behavioral therapist right there. Um, so that helped a lot. The, the other thing that we ended up doing near the end was flipping the embedded part. We think of embedding the psychologist in primary care. We started to embed primary care in the psychologist's office and embed a physical therapist in the psychologist psychology office. And that also helped a lot. And none of it was, none of it turned out perfect. We had all kinds of difficulty getting paid and um, making it work, but we, we never stopped because once you start doing this and you see the need for it, you really can't turn your back on it after that. But it, it takes a long time. Um, and, and so I'm really thrilled to hear what you're what you're doing and want to help 
any way that I can. It's it's great. It's great stuff. You're you're muted still, Kevin. Not unusual. <laughs> Other questions see. or comments from board members? Yeah, I have I have just one. Um, during your pre and thank you very much for this presentation. Um, during your presentation, you uh, I think you said that, uh, that developing the collaborative process was uh, easier with uh, entities that are, are are based on value based payments. And that kind of makes sense to me because there's more flexibility to be innovative rather than be, you know, nailed down to a bunch of procedure codes. But I'm I'm wondering if there's a bias in that in that. In Vermont, anyhow, most of the commercial carriers are still on a fee-for-service platform, and whether or not. Um, so, if you could talk a little bit of, about the, the the types of entities that you're engaging that are value-based versus engaging um, entities which are fee-for-service based. Yeah. So um, we are we are providing the same. So so we're not. Uh, we're, the model we're providing is is the model we're providing whether you are a patient whose payer is fee for service or is a value based payment has a value based payment model. Um, what we really had to do was balance um, what that looked like us, but what that looked like for us over our entire population. And so when we looked at um, how we're going to pay for this. Um, the Intermountain model has an article published in JAMA that shows that they invested $22 per member per year in this program, and they saw a return of invest return on investment of $117 or $112, excuse, excuse me, per member per year on the program. And so we took that data and we said, okay, if we only achieve half of that, so we only get, what was it, $57.50 per member per year in return, um, we would start to see in our population um, a break even uh, uh, in the expense of this model by 2024. And if we did if we did not if we did not see a positive return, we just got back the $22 we invested and we were able to replicate that $22, um, then we would see a, a break even point around 2026. So that's so we modeled that out as our value based um, uh, not PL, but our value based uh, model. And at the same time, we looked at our population and, and, and learned that across the network, again, factoring in New York, um, we only had 47% of our patients in primary care on a value-based payment model. Again, this was February of 2020. So that number probably has shifted a little bit. Um, and so we said, in addition to um, making the argument that this, that this program works in a value-based payment model, we need to be able to account for the, the other half of our business at the time that that is still fee for service. And so when we looked at that information, and I am looking off to my side because I have the numbers on my other screen. Um, when we looked at that information, um, the, the, the argument or the logic we used was that we know that 43% of mental health patients are on Medicaid versus 18% in the, in the general patient population. Um, and that's inpatient. Outpatient replicates that 32% of mental health patients are on Medicaid versus 14% for all other diagnoses. So already we have a, a larger portion of our population that, that are on Medicaid. Um, we also know that 58% of all ED visits at UVMC include a mental health visit, um, which uh, we had mentioned earlier. And then 16% of ED uh, 16% of the ED uh, census on average is carrying a mental health diagnosis. So the, the number of touches that the ED sees of mental health is, is so disproportionate. And one of the, we have many clinical outcomes we're, we're tracking with this. One of the clinical outcomes is a reduction in that ED utilization. The idea is to identify patients in, in a time of uh, pre-crisis, we'll say, and to be able to tr uh, reach out to them and treat them so that they do not escalate to that ED utilization, which um, does not bode well for a fee-for-service payment model. And so um, in answering your question, we, we 
you know, we're 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 dealing with the payers we're dealing with, and we're trusting our contracting division to start to 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 edge people in one way or the other. But the care model we developed um, is the same one received by everybody, and um, we just had to really look at the financials for both types of models that we're dealing with. Okay, other comments or questions from board members? I just want to say thanks for the information. It was a really interesting presentation and it's great to hear uh, the, about this work. Super, so at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer a comment about uh, the integration efforts by the University of Vermont Health Network? Um, hi, my name is Sophia, and I am a current student studying healthcare. Um, and I'm just wondering if you see this model expanding to other areas of care as well, um, outside of just mental health, or if you think a different model would be necessary. Do you mean like a I'll say a primary care neurology integration, like a different specialty in place of mental health? Um, I guess I mean outside of the realm of mental health. Like, do you see this model expanding to kind of general care so that more preventative care can be incorporated? Oh, oh. Yeah, so, so I guess like how much can the role of the physician kind of increase? How much can we connect different types of providers um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could touch on that a bit. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna. I'll touch on it, and then I'm gonna hand off to Dr. Keegan. So um, I think I think there are ways we can expand, and I think there are some ways we have expanded. I think where the balance comes in is um, um, the prevalence of the problem in in the balance of what the primary care provider can hold in there head. So we are part of this program is training the primary care providers to interact with mental health conditions differently. Um, it, as we start, and part of the reason we're doing that is because there's such an abundance of mental health uh, conditions in primary care. Um, if we were to replicate that with another specialty um, and continue to add to what we're expecting the, the, the generalists, the primary care providers to um, to process, we would. I think we would need to be able to justify that we have. Uh, I don't know if we'll have a similar, but we have. You know, a, a, another robust volume of patients that would be treated, um, because the primary care doctors are primary care doctors. They're not specialists, and so um, you know, I think conceptually it could certainly work. Um, but I'll, I'll. That's my administrative point of view. I'll, I'll hand off to Dr. Keegan. Thank you, Maureen. The aspect that I can think of that sort of is happening already is the e-consult that Dr. Pulaski mentioned. So for psychiatry, what that means is I ask Dr. Pulaski to review the chart and then she sends me back a message in the electronic health record with her recommendations. And we also have that available. It's just recently started with other specialties. So one example is if we have a patient, we're now recommended to screen everybody, every adult for hepatitis C because, uh, the example I give is that in the 1970s, we didn't know hepatitis C existed, so we didn't have the same sort of sterilization practices and people could have been exposed through dental care or other things. That So even if you don't have what you would think of as a risk factor for hepatitis C, you could have acquired it without realizing. So we are screening people, but then if you have a positive screen, what do you do? And um, hepatitis C is actually something where management of that is within the scope of primary care. There's a medication that can be given. And so we can request an e-consult from gastroenterology. And similarly, the patient would not see the gastroenterologist. That would take months for them to get an actual appointment to see the gastroenterologist face to face. But instead, within one to two weeks, I can get a message back from the hepatologist giving me guidance on how to manage this specific patient. Um, and that's just one example. There's multiple other specialties that we have e-consults available for. Um, I think the behavioral health care manager piece is something that's really uniquely um, applicable to mental health care. And like Maureen said, um, there's such a high proportion of patients who have a mental health concern that that is why 
it makes sense to have a care manager dedicated to the mental health concerns within a practice. It might make sense to have, we also have um, a nurse care manager who helps with chronic care. So that with a lot of chronic medical conditions. So that is a sort of similar pathway. So my patients with diabetes and multiple other medical problems can have a nurse care manager who's working with them as well. And that's another value-based uh, implementation that we have going on. So I think some of that is actually already happening. Sophia, thanks for the question. Okay, next I'm gonna call on Ham Davis. Ham. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I wonder if you could ask a sort of a question and a half through you to what Dr. Brumstead. Uh, one of the questions here that you know, in the backdrop is the need there are simply not enough psychiatrists available. Um, my question is, and the, of course the, the backdrop here is that the, there's a huge wait time problem across the board of service at UVM. My question is this, and it's a che cheating a little bit, I know, because the budgets are not due out for another two weeks. But I, first, my question is, um, will the will the UVM budget have enough money uh, to make this project work? And the secondary sort of question is, is the constraint on is the constraint on the number of of psychiatrists or any other particular skill? Is that constraint driven by difficulties in recruitment, or is it driven by uh, lack of money? I think he's directing that question to you, John. <laughs> I thought it was to you, Chair Mullen. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, uh, budget uh, is uh, for the UVM Health Network is not complete until June 30th when our Board of Trustees approves the budget. Um, uh, but what's contained uh, in that budget um, uh, are uh, many open physician positions, not just in psychiatry, but across the board. So it's not a, a money issue. Uh, uh, specifically HAM, um, it's almost uh, across the board a uh, recruitment issue. And we're actually not doing terrible at recruitment, um, uh, but um, there's obviously uh, a lot of need. And so we have open positions. For this particular uh, program, um, uh, it does, as Maureen say, have incredibly um, uh, high value and high stature uh, for both the clinical uh, and the human aspects, but also from a, a business uh, uh, perspective. Um, and so um, this is a, a program that um, uh, is budgeted to succeed. Correct me if I'm wrong, Maureen, but I think, again, this is uh, high priority stuff, uh, stuff yeah. for us. Yes, I um, everything I put in the 23 budget um, for this program is still there as of now. And that's a little bit unique in the current environment within the UVM Health Network, which speaks to its uh, high priority. Thank you, Kevin. Thank okay, you. is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing on like my uh, colleagues on the board, I want to thank the team from UVM. It's uh, been fascinating learning about this uh, integration project and uh, something that uh, definitely needed. And uh, to hear about successes is always uh, very encouraging. So thank you for the work that you're doing every day. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you. And next I'm going to um, go to the next item on the agenda which is the Accountable Care Organization guidance. And I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Marissa Melamed. Marissa. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Can you hear me all right? We can. Okay, great. I'm going to present the slides. Uh, looks like it's loading. Let me know when you can see it.
Is it showing up all right? I'm just getting the circle still, but maybe others have it already. I see some nods. I'm trying a different thing for presenting. So oh, let me I have it now. <laughs> can't see it. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again and good afternoon. Um, I'm Marissa Melamed, uh, Associate Director of Health Systems Policy of the Green Mountain Care Board. I oversee the ACO oversight process. I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Julia Bowles, Senior uh, Health Policy Analyst, and Michelle Sawyer, Health Policy Project Director, and we have legal support from Russ McCracken. And today is part two, a continuation of our ACO guidance uh, presentation from last week. So the agenda for today, I'm just going to do some quick uh, review of slides. They're really just for reference. They're the same as last week, so I'm not going to spend time on the first few slides. Um, today, we're going to focus on the documents that we're required to develop and produce for certified ACOs in Vermont. So this includes the certification eligibility form and the budget guidance. I'll review next steps and we'll do questions and public comments. So these are the slides, again, as a reminder that we reviewed last week. Um, there's sort of two tracks of oversight, the ACO budget review and the ACO certification. Um, and, you know, they're required to produce uh, or we're required to produce the, the documentation that we're reviewing with you today. Uh, and uh, again, this is a breakdown of how the statute works. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the uh, left side uh, for ACOs that plan to accept payments from Vermont, One Care Vermont. Uh, last week, we presented on the guidance for Medicare only ACOs. And these are the standards and requirements by which we review the ACO submission. Specifically, I want to draw your attention um, to Rule 5, uh, Section uh, 5.405, um, where the board um, may establish uh, benchmarks, and those can be uh, part of the review. Um, the guidance is developed based on the criteria listen, listed in 18 BSA 9382, um, as well as elements of um, the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization model agreement between the state of Vermont and CMS. And a reminder that we also have, uh, the board has broad discretion to review um, any issues. So the guidance is, is built with um, this criteria in mind. And that the ACO has the burden of justifying its budget to the board. Um, so we ask questions and provide this guidance to try to get the information that we need. Um, and if, you know, it's, it's it's on the ACO to um, be complete in their responses. Again, I reviewed this last week, so I'm not going to go over it again. Um, just the priorities that this is that this guidance is based upon, um, and the outcomes that we will issue the reporting manual, which we've already done, and these pieces of guidance by the end of the month. Same. I reviewed this slide last week. Some of the goals, uh, specific goals that we had set for this year. Um, are on the uh, right side of this slide as well as a reminder. So for this section, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Sawyer, who looks at the certification. She's going to review the certification eligibility form. And Michelle, you can just let me know when you want me to advance. Thank you very much, Marissa. Um, so here is an overview of the certification process uh, for ACOs. As mentioned before, all ACOs that accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance must be certified once initially. And once certified, an ACO must annually submit a form to the board to verify that they are continuing to meet the certification requirements um, and to describe any material changes to any matters addressed in the certification sections of Rule 5. So the following, um, this list is of the sections of Rule 5 that cover the requirements for certification of an ACO. I won't take the time to read through the list, but anybody can refer back to this slide um, for that information. Next slide, please. So the 2023 certification materials have undergone changes um, with the intention of improving the clarity and the breadth of questions while also reducing uh, burden for both the ACO and our staff. 
the materials include a set of narrative questions and a small Excel workbook that collects data uh, regarding the ACO's policies and procedures. So the material changes are as follows. Um, we added word limits to each of the narrative questions in a word to in an effort to uh, elicit answers that are direct and concise. Uh, we updated and rephrased questions to improve both clarity and to focus more on updates and changes rather than asking for overviews of operations and procedures with which we are already familiar. Uh, we created a single Excel workbook, which combined two previous separate documents, and we added four new questions to the narrative form. Um, questions 8, 9, 10, and 15 were uh, added to address certification requirements 5.206 GIK and 5.207 B. Um, these were areas that had required follow-up conversation with OneCare last year, so we are hoping to gather that information in a written form for 2023 and make sure we are covering all of the certification requirements as spelled out in Rule 5. Um, we would also like to note that the staff did share drafts of these materials with both the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and OneCare to gather and incorporate feedback. Uh, next slide, please. The materials will be posted on our website under the 2023 ACO budget and certification uh, section and uh, issued to OneCare by July 1st, along with the budget guidance. And it must be completed and submitted to us on or before September 1st. And from there, the staff will process the submission. And as a reminder, no vote is needed from the board regarding the certification materials. I will hand it back to Marissa uh, to kick off the budget guidance review. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So today's focus is on the certified ACO budget guidance. Unlike the certification form, the board does need to vote to approve the updates to the guidance. We do this annually. Um, and One Care Vermont is currently the only certified ACO in Vermont, so the, the only ACO um, that is subject to this guidance. So themes for the FY23 updates. So each section, last year we took the FY22 guidance, um, and each section was reviewed for the objective, what is the purpose of this section, uh, what data and source documents, so what is sort of the primary data that we are collecting and reviewing for this section, and then what are the key narrative questions that we need or explanation to describe the data. Goal, you know, goals that we'd set in previous years were to make the review more data-driven, so we wanted to focus on what data are we collecting, um, what are the primary source documents, and how do they need to be explained. No, Sounds like someone maybe is not muted. Just um, okay. uh, and so a highlight of Yay! updates. Um, if we could just oh. ask uh, whoever <laughs> doesn't have their mic muted to mute it so that we can hear clearly. Or, uh, thank you. So the highlight of updates. So we added submission instructions, um, which I think will be really helpful in setting expectations ahead of time. Some of these instructions, which are spelled out in the beginning, are things we tend to sort of hash out through email, but we uh, put them in the guidance this year. It's things like um, how to, you know, actually do the submission, how to name things, how to send them to us. Um, you know, expectations around binders and such. So um, we're just putting this in uh, up front. Um, we updated the COVID-19 language to reflect the current environment. Uh, we worked on the questions uh, considerably to make them more targeted um, based on internal review. So in some cases, you, you might see less questions and in some you might see more because they're more specific. Um, and this was based on uh, internal review and then several iterations of stakeholder review um, with One Care um, and the HCA uh, also took a look at this guidance ahead of time. Um, and I want to say we had a um, particularly collaborative process uh, with One Care this year in terms of going back and forth and, and going through detailed questions and uh, templates. And I think we've made some uh, really good improvements 
through the, the process this year, um, which also includes removing areas of duplication. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but um, we found that um, information was being repeated in multiple places because of the way questions were asked. And so we tried to identify those and um, make more sort of holistic questions that, that would reduce duplication of answers. Um, while at the same time, we're also trying to reduce the amount of follow-up questions that are required after the ACO submits their budget. Um, and so um, in addition to going through all the guidance questions, um, we also went through the follow-up questions of which there are, are quite a few from last year um, in two rounds and tried to incorporate that information uh, upfront into the guidance if we felt like it wasn't clear. Uh, so again, I, I mentioned it there, improved data collection and templates. You'll see we actually consolidated several templates into one. Um, another significant uh, change and improvement this year is we are prepared to transition to the ACO uh, reporting their financial information into the adaptive database the way that hospitals do. This is actually a change that we've been working on for several years. It's been delayed for various reasons, um, but this is going to improve um, quite a few things. Year-over-year -year reporting, um, the problem we have of passing Excel documents back and forth um, and having sort of corrupted data or, you know, version control, um, losing historical information. Um, and so both teams, I think, are really excited uh, about this. Um, there are some implications for that transition, which I'll talk about when we get to that section, but um, it's an exciting improvement. Um, and then the other thing we're going to talk about is an introduction of budget and performance targets, um, which was an expectation that was set up in last year's review. So I'm going to talk about what we're recommending there. So I reviewed this last week. This slide has no change from last week. The outline is still the same. Um, it's just to call out that um, we sort of targeted sections one, two, and three a little more. Section five and eight are actually new sections. Um, and so I'll talk about those in more detail when we get there. So I'm gonna, we're gonna go through, oh, and really, oh no, this is where I pass it to you, Julia. Sorry, I thought I, I stole your slide. Julia's gonna present the next couple of sections. <laughs> no problem. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, so we will dive into the sections. We have sort of um, just as a general format, the section objective and data sources, and then kind of details about what changed, um, just because there's a lot to cover here. So um, starting with section one, um, the objective is really to provide a brief narrative that summarizes all of the components of the submission. Um, as, as folks know, it is a large submission, so it's helpful to kind of look at this as an overview section. Um, and so there's a lot of items listed here, but um, they kind of correspond to each of the sections throughout and just getting a high level update. Um, and because this is the executive summary, there aren't any specific documents or data for this particular section. Um, and on the next slide, um, we wanted to highlight the main changes of section one, um, which were making revisions just to more clearly identify which information should be in the executive summary and which um, which we did by editing the sub bullets of question one, um, just to make them a little bit more clear. Um, and additionally, we changed the title to be executive summary, whereas before it was called information and background. Um, again, just to more clearly define the purpose of this section um, and show that it can really be very um, brief and high level. Um, so on the next slide, section two um, is ACO provider contracts. The goal of this section is to describe the ACO network um, or the ACO network development strategy and any changes to the provider agreements um, for the upcoming budget year. And the data sources are the provider lists and the provider agreements. And so specifically on the next slide, um, just a second, perfect. Um, the changes in this section were to really narrow the focus on, to, to be focused on the contract itself. Um, whereas questions that were more broad about the ACO's programs in a general way were moved to a new section, um, section five, which Marissa will be covering um, in a bit. But um, specifically for question number one, we added summary tables um, both or in the appendix, um, the numbers are listed here, um, and we updated the submission deadline to October 15th to reflect that this information comes from a federal report due to CMS on September 30th, 
and that it always takes a little bit of time to convert that into the GMCV's format. Um, and so just giving it a more appropriate and realistic date for that. Um, for questions four and five, we added a summary table, um, one in the narrative and one, which is appendix 2.2.3. Um, which are both tables that OneCare used in their submission last year and that we found helpful. So we just wanted to um, put them in at the start. Um, and finally, for question six, uh, we added it to focus specifically on, again, the provider contracts, which is um, the agreement between OneCare and the provider. Um, and some of the elements in this question um, or an older version of this question, again, got moved to a later section. So content wasn't lost here, but this section looks a little bit shorter than it did before, just because of some rearranging that we did. Um, and on the next slide, section three is um, similar, but focused on the payer contracts. Um, and the objective of this section is to describe the ACO's expected or assumed payer arrangements that were used to construct the budget. Um, and assess payer agreements for qualifying as scale target initiatives. And the data for this section is the ACO scale target forms and payer program um, contractual agreements, which are not submitted until after they are fully executed. Um, so on the next slide, um, we can walk through the specific changes. Um, so the main change was again to um, similar to section two to narrow it to focus really on the agreement between the payer and one care. Um, and the questions that were more broad, again, were moved to section five. Um, and specific changes included adding, adding summary language to question two, um, or adding a summary table, and then with follow up questions only if things changed, as opposed to asking for narrative about programs that, um, in some capacity, may have remained the same from last year. Um, so that's a way to help try and streamline. Um, answers in this section. Um, and additionally, we added language about scale to align with the um, FY22 budget order number four, um, just to follow up on, on that condition. Um, question three, we talked about this recently with the revised budget presentation last month, but the fixed perspective payment question was rewritten to align with the new reporting manual template for this year. Um, and finally, in question four about Medicare Advantage, we added a question to um, assess the status of the FY22 budget order condition number six, um, which says that one care shall work with Medicare Advantage plans operating in Vermont with a specific focus on Vermont based plans to develop scale target qualifying programs for FY23. Um, so that is it for the sections I'm covering and I will hand it back to Marissa for section four. Great. Thank you, Julia. So section four is about the total cost of care. And the goal of this section is to describe the assumptions used to set uh, trend rates and total cost of care targets by payer program and the drivers that are affecting uh, settlement results of the prior year. So, and this is the same um, section, this is what section four was last year as well. Uh, the data source, the data that, or the, the data and the sources that we collect for this section um, are two appendices, uh, total cost of care performance by payer, uh, total ACO wide, and we do have um, historical data uh, reported for comparison purposes um, and uh, projected and budgeted trend rates by payer program. So the main change here is that we were actually able to eliminate a table that we had. It was settlement by HSA, um, and it was identified through our collaboration with OneCare that this information could be incorporated into a template that was redesigned for Section 5. Um, so the information is not lost. It's just in a new uh, consolidated template. Um, in question one, uh, total cost of care performance by payer, total ACO, wi uh, total ACO wide. This is um, questions in reference to Appendix 4.1. Um, there were some edits to clarify the instructions. Question two, a settlement by payer and by HSA. Um, again, this is what I just uh, ex explained, um, that Appendix 4.2 or the old 4.2 was removed um, because settlement um, by... Uh, by hospital is reported through financial performance presentation in November. So um, the ACO has historically come to before the board in November or December to report um, settlement results from 
the prior year or the, the most recent year that results are available. Um, and so instead of asking for this somewhat prematurely in October and then getting again when they when they present, um, we are just referring to that um, presentation for uh, settlement results. Um, question three is in reference to the table uh, projected and budgeted trend rates by payer program. Um, there is a question that was clarified to be consistent with benchmark trend rates for the um, ACO attributed population in the GMCB approved rate filings. Um, I'm going to talk about this at a later slide um, because this is something that the board has consistently put in their order just to be consistent um, across these two, uh, you know, that, that the rate that's approved elsewhere should be consistent in this process. Um, and so th that is actually a proposed target. Um, that I'm going to talk about. We also clarified it because it, it's it's referred to in this question. Um, and then the question was also updated to reflect how total cost of care targets are distributed. Um, as you know, the model, the risk model changed uh, several years ago now to be um, HSA target setting to ACO wide, and and we still needed to make some updates to questions to reflect that change. Um, I'll say here too that there actually is still um, one care had proposed a change to the trend rates table, which we are still reviewing. At the moment, we left it as is because we weren't prepared to accept that um, change. Um, however, if we find that it's a recommendation we want to make, um, we can still bring it to the board. But at the moment, the table is uh, consistent with prior years. So section five is a new section. Um, the objective of this section, it's called, we called it the ACO network program and risk arrangement policies. Um, so the idea here is, as Julia talked about, the ACO has agreements with providers and it has agreements with payers. Um, those base agreements may not change um, considerably from one year to the next. Um, a lot of the um, more like specific year-to-year -year changes happen through policy. The, the agreements um, refer to or sort of delegate um, some of the decision-making to the policies, which are set by the One Care Board of Managers. And so that is how the program, the ACO programs are really developed. And so we used to ask these questions like, you know, for your payer programs, for your provider um, programs, we would try to ask the questions we were asking were more sort of ACO wide, not based on payer or provider agreements. So we narrowed the payer and provider sections, um, uh, two and three, the ones that Julia went over, and we um, made this sort of more holistic section for the ACO to discuss their network programs, the, the, their ACO specific um, network programs, which much is based on um, uh, policies that are set. So the objective here is to describe ACO program policies for provider payments and risk arrangements, describe the ACO risk model by payer and risk bearing entity, and any ACO held risk and third party risk protection. So the risk management section was also um, incorporated in, into the section as well. And the data and uh, sources here are there are two appendices. Uh, risk by payer and risk bearing entity and share saving and, and loss by payer by HSA and uh, primary care and, and risk bearing entity or hospital. Um, there was some significant work done on these tables. Um, I think there was maybe four tables that were consolidated into these two tables based on feedback that we got from one care. So that was, um, I think, a really helpful uh, collaboration to make to reduce sort of duplication of where information is presented um, and consolidate that information into these two tables under this section. So specifically, I, I touched on this already, but um, question, a lot of the questions are the same. They were pulled from the provider and the payer contract sections to create this new section. So it reduced sort of the duplication of asking for them twice. Um, so question one is about provider payment strategies. Um, this was moved. Um, question two uh, is about ACO program goals, strategies, opportunities, and limitations. This is a new question that combines elements of past questions on risk management and provider network development. 
Question three is about the ACO risk model, and it was updated. So the, the updated data submission is sort of the the, the source, um, the, the primary source for this question, um, though the question about the ACO risk model is the same um, as FY22. Also in section five um, are questions about management of risk and financial liability. Um, the risk model and the total cost of care accountability strategy at the HSA level. Um, again, this is a question that we've had um, that we put into uh, this section. Um, as well, we ask for any additional documentation on the ACO's management of financial risk that may not have been included already. Section six is the ACO uh, budget or financial. So the objective of this section is for the ACO to submit the ACO financial plan um, prepared according to the full accountability or the non-GAAP and the entity level GAAP financial sheets. Uh, GAAP is generally accepted accounting principles and this is a change that we've been working on um, and really implemented last year to see these two views. Um, as well, there are some customized additional financial sheets that we specify, um, for example, sources and uses, population health management expense breakout, a hospital specific reporting, uh, leadership and management salaries. And, uh, you know, a main objective of this section is to describe the major variances in the financial plan from the prior year, um, as well as the transition to use of the adaptive database that is in. Um, that is set to, to be implemented uh, for the 2023 budget submission. So the main change is the Excel templates are now in adaptive. They are called sheets A1, A2, and A3. Those are the standard financial sheets. Um, information that is collected in this section, again, full accountability budget, entity level budget, variance analysis report, um, ACO management compensation, and IRS form 990, uh, and the financial audit. Some of these things come at slightly different time schedules in the budget submission just because of the when they are prepared, but we call them out in the guidance because um, they are key piece documents. Um, the, we specified that the IRS, well, so the IRS Form 90, the one that will be turned in next is the 2021. And then for the management compensation, we're asking for projected uh, for the current year. And a big difference that people may um, think of here is that previously we published financial sheets in Excel. Um, since they're in adaptive, um, the way that those, report, those reports now will have to be generated by GMCB staff um, into Office Connect for board member and public review. This is the way that it's done with hospital budgets, um, is my understanding. So that shouldn't be anything new and we'll sort of avoid. Um, it'll, it'll mean that we, the, the, the reports are more clear because we won't have different versions of Excel uh, floating around. Other updates to the templates for section uh, six. So there's no change to the sources and uses table. The hospital participation table 6.5, this was actually identified as a needed improvement last year and it didn't happen. So they had to fill out the same template. Um, however, one care came to us with a proposal to update this um, template for this year, which we've accepted. It consolidates all the hospitals into a single template um, for ease of filling it out, um, the categories by payer are revised to more accurately reflect the payment structures and the risk elements were removed from this table because they're reported in a different uh, template. I mentioned the IRS form 990 and the management uh, compensation uh, submission and then tab 6.8 population health management expense breakout. Um, there was two improvements that were identified here. One, um, that um, bonus payments where the ACL will budget the dollar amount, but not the actual distribution of, across provider types. Um, we want to be able to identify where that is. So this 
table might show like this much money is available to be paid out, but might not be exactly what is paid out. So we need to clarify that. And then another um, improvement that was identified is that um, somehow to be clear that blank cells, are they blank because there's no money allocated or because provider um, types are ineligible for payments in that category? So there will be some clarification through this template, but also I think in an earlier section uh, under providers, we are um, looking to clarify which which providers are eligible for which uh, types of payments and what what has changed, if anything, from prior years. So we'll be able to get at that information a couple of different ways. Uh, the next section is population health. So I'm going to turn that over to Michelle Sawyer. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, yes, so Section 7 is population health. Um, the objective is to collect data and information on the ACO's approach to population health management and care delivery. Um, so we, we receive data in the forms of five different appendices. Um, so we have the ACO clinical focus areas simply compares the status of these areas. Um, for fiscal year 2021 to the current progress in these same areas for fiscal year 2022. Um, the high cost conditions gives us the prevalence of each of the top five highest cost conditions by payer um, from 2018 through 2022. Uh, Appendix 7.3 is population health and payment reform. It's, this is something that we've collected uh, multiple times. It's just a convenient way for us to capture basic information about all of the different population health programs delivered by the ACO. And Appendices 7.4 and 7.5 um, have to do with care coordination efforts. Um, 7.4 focuses on um, a, kind of a comparison between 2021 and 2022, given that there was a model shift between those years. And uh, 7.5 is new. It provides us with data regarding the amounts paid out to different provider types for each program year starting in 2018. Uh, next slide, please. So the main change uh, changes were res a result of wanting to make sure that we appropriately capture information regarding One Care's new care coordination model, uh, which was implemented in 2022. Uh, and as a reminder, this shifted how providers are paid for care coordination, how providers report these activities, and uh, the subpopulations of focus. Um, we also moved questions covering evaluation of any of the population health efforts to Section 8, um, which covers all evaluation and performance benchmarking. So question one, model of care is a question that asks for a large array of information about the model. Um, we narrowed the focus from an overview of the model to really drill down on how implementation is going, um, the status of goal achievement and any changes made or planned for the model. Um, we added questions about how health equity shows up in their model of care, as well as um, how and if race and ethnicity data are collected and what role they play in the model. And we also asked about um, variations in care delivery and care coordination efforts between HSAs. So for question two, um, clinical focus areas, we provided an updated appendices that um, uh, compared uh, 2021 outcomes to the current 2022 progress and focused the narrative on how quality measures are selected um, and, and methods of evaluations that are used in this area. Next slide, please. All right, question three is around quality improvement. Um, previously, we had asked for HSA level data on four different measures. Um, we found that the usefulness of this information was limited within our purview. Um, so as an effort to bring up the lens from which we are viewing this data, we both el eliminated three of the four measures for reporting. And the fourth measure, which is the five most prevalent high cost conditions, will be reported by payer program rather than HSA. Um, we removed a prompt about the effects of the pandemic. We assume that if the pandemic affected quality efforts, that this would be noted in the narrative provided by the ACO. Uh, question five is care coordination. 
the most notable changes to the population health section occurred with this question. Um, previously, there were three appendices. This year, there are two, and one of those is brand new, as I described. Um, the new appendix captures payments made to um, different provider types for care coordination activities over time. And question six is the integration of social services. Um, this question was only minorly changed. We asked about whether or not the ACO has evaluated the efficacy of integrating social services into their overall model, and if so, to share the results of those evaluations. Um, and I will hand this back to Marissa to review section eight. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, there's two more sections and then the uh, budget targets and um, monitoring revised budget. So we're getting there. Um, section eight is new. Um, it's evaluation and performance benchmarking. Um, so what we did here is we pulled all evaluation type questions from other sections and focused them into their own section. Um, we're also including here um, information um, about the performance benchmarking system, which the board ordered in the 22 uh, budget order. So the objective of the section is to discuss evaluation of provider satisfaction with ACO participation and ACO network program um, and evaluation of the ACO quality improvement program. Also discuss use of key performance indicators, um, which was discussed during their budget hearing uh, last year and uh, implementation of an ACO performance benchmarking system. And then we didn't, um, we're not asking for specific data here, um, but any relevant documents that are identified by, ACO, uh, by the ACO that they've produced um, around evaluation could be provided. So this is a new section with questions pulled from across the guidance to concentrate evaluation questions in one section. Questions one to five, um, are about provider satisfaction, risk management, uh, population health management programs, quality improvement, KPIs. These are pulled from other sections of the guidance and follow-up questions from last year. Um, question six is um, for the, the ACO to provide an update on the benchmarking tool implementation um, to assess the status of FY22 budget order conditions number one and two. Um, this is also an area where the board may introduce performance targets where I'm gonna talk about um, in, a, in a next section um, or in a future section. Uh, also in section eight, uh, on the next slide actually, <laughs> um, question six, um, asks about um, performance targets linked to national benchmarks. So the FY22 budget order condition number 2B um, requires that the FY23 budget, budget guidance um, introduce performance targets linked to national benchmarks along with enforcement mechanisms where One Care Vermont does not perform at the levels outlined in the guidance. Um, so the order required us to, to do this and include it. Um, so the way that we are doing this is we're asking the ACO to provide progress to date on implementing the benchmarking tool and available data to establish baselines. Now, the Green Mountain Care Board staff, um, our team has been working really closely with um, One Care um, on implementing this condition. We meet with them regularly and we've gone back and forth about um, uh, expectations and development of a report. Um, and they are in the middle of um, contracting um, and we're pretty um, aware of where they are in um, implementing this, this, um, this requirement. Um, however, we don't have um, a completed or submitted report in time for this guidance. Um, we actually never would have expected to have it in time for this guidance. Um, so we had to kind of work around this requirement a little bit. Um, we're, we're hoping to have it for the, um, budget submission, we can talk about the, the timing at a, at a later date, but it's not ready in time for the guidance. Um, so the way to, um, um, to satisfy this requirement is, is we are introducing this concept of setting um, performance targets. Um, so any targets that are set for 23, for example, or future years would be determined by the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and we are taking into consideration the implementation status of the benchmarking system. Um, these targets could include like performance targets. We're looking for um, at or above the 50th percentile, for example. Um, their um, enforcement 
um, like a range for when we might require a performance improvement plan, um, and then what those performance improvement plan might require. Um, for example, um, discussion of best practices used by ACOs that are in a 90th percentile, which was um, the 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 ability to um, you know investigate uh, best practices was part of the requirement of of the tool in the board's order. Um, so we are not recommending um, setting any performance benchmarks um, or targets for this guidance, um, but we are uh, introducing the the concept as um, as provisional. And we'll continue to um, to keep you up to date on when um, we would have a recommendation there. Section nine um, is a section that we've that we've always had. It's just a new a new number since we added sections. It's um, one of those criteria that I mentioned very very far into the beginning um, about uh, information needed to uh, comply with a report on Vermont's all payer model agreement. Um, so the objective of this section is to describe strategies for assisting the state to achieve the goals of the Vermont All Payer Model Agreement, describe the ACO's role in achieving the goals, and identify opportunities for stakeholder collaboration to achieve the goals. So this section is an opportunity for the ACO to make clear um, where they feel their role is, what they feel they can um, affect in terms of the statewide goals, um, and where they see um, Addition, you know, opportunities for, um, uh, you know, collaboration with other stakeholders or where other stakeholders can, you know, assist them in achieving the goals. Um, the data source here, we have one appendix um, around all pair model quality measures. And again, there are no major changes to the section. Um, the evaluation question was moved to section eight. Um, so that, yeah, that can concludes the reporting sections. There's two other parts that are included in the guidance. Part two is the ACO budget targets. So the board may establish targets or benchmarks to guide the development or implementation of the ACO's budget. Um, in prior years, we have provided this data source, the Medicare United States per capita fee for service projections. Um, we provide this um, uh, each year, I think it comes out in the spring as a reference for trend rate and total cost of care target setting. So um, that table is updated for 2022 to 2023 um, as as um, trend rate and and target setting um, guidance. But the the way we're doing this hasn't hasn't changed. It's um, we've we've always included that table. Um, what we're adding this year to this section is that this section has always included um, this other targets and benchmarks. So um, the language is the board may add other targets or benchmarks to guide the development or implementation of the ACO's budget. Such benchmarks set in the past have included an administrative expense ratio and a population health investment ratio, among others. You can see uh, prior year budget orders for examples. Um, this year, so as I already mentioned, we're not proposing per performance benchmarks for the reasons I already described, but we are proposing uh, to sort of introduce this topic um, to budget targets that we identified could be uh, set up front if you so choose. Um, in the past, they've been ordered kind of on the back end. At the end of the process, we've said you must do these things, um, but they could be done up front. Um, and the reason that staff feel this would be helpful is because the ACO, um, like any budgeting entity or the hospitals, um, uh, creates their budget um, over the, the summer and goes through their budgeting process with their board of managers um, and brings to the board an approved budget that's gone through their board of managers. If we can set guidance up front that, that the board wants See, then they can take those. They can take that guidance to their board and say, uh, "Look, our regulator has told us to um, meet these requirements," um, and it could um, sort of streamline the process somewhat and hash out some things on the front end. Um, so we have two proposals um, that are um, I uh, are things that we have ordered in the past that we think the the, the board could rec uh, propose or, or accept upfront. 
Um, the first one is to fund the value-based incentive fund or other pre-funded clinical quality incentive programs at a minimum of the FY22 revised budget amount. Um, and the second is that the FY23 commercial benchmark trend rates must be consistent with the ACO attributed population and the GMCB approved rate filings. Um, number two has been in the budget order as long as we've been doing budget orders, I think. So I don't think it's um, wildly out of line in any way. And I think that there's, that um, one care probably already uh, does that. There may be a year that I can remember that there was some discussion around this, um, but the board could choose to set that up front, that expectation up front. Um, and the first one, um, there was some discussion around the funding of the uh, value-based incentive fund in the prior, uh, this, this past year, the board did make some adjustments there. Um, this number has fluctuated um, over the years. And if um, the board um, feels strongly that you'd like to set the expectation up front, um, that it is set um, at at least the amounts of the current year, um, we identified this as a possible uh, target. Um, I also want to say one thing about a, a target that we're not recommending because it's had quite a, a bit of discussion, and that's around um, setting a commercial fixed perspective payment target um, that's been discussed by the board. Um, the reason that we're not recommending a target at this time um, is, is two things. So um, OneCare has publicly presented several times a goal of 23.9% commercial fixed perspective payments for 23. Um, but we do know this is aspirational based on conversations, um, but this is, the, this is the goal that they had set. Um, we're not recommending um, a target or accepting um, or endorsing the target at this time um, for two reasons. Um, one, we're waiting for reporting from the ACO in July um, before the staff are ready to endorse their baseline and target setting methodology. So I think um, Julia touched on this earlier. We have updated reporting on fixed perspective payment um, uh, like targets and, and baseline setting that is due to us in July. So we don't have that in time um, to say like, yes, we endorse this target. Um, but the second reason um, is, is maybe more significant in that setting a mandatory or binding fixed perspective payment percentage in the ACL process um, that isn't binding on payers, um, which are which are parties to the relevant contracts and need to agree to any fixed perspective payment percentage, um, is problematic from a legal and enforcement perspective. Um, so there are some other um, avenues um, to 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 get there because I know it's of importance to the board, um, but at this time we're uh, not recommending it as a budget target. But I did not want to ignore it as an issue. Uh, part three of the guidance is the revised budget. Um, <clears throat> this is just updated to align with the FY22 revised budget process. Um, this process has been pretty well established, I think, over the past couple seasons. We are still um, sort of refining it to make it, you know, go smoothly. <laughs> Excuse me, and be consistent. Um, and those deliverables are due spring 23 or upon execution of payer contracts, excuse me. <clears throat> Part four is around monitoring. Again, we just updated this to align with the FY22 reporting manual, which you can view at the link um, <clears throat> that's on this slide if you want to see what those reporting templates look like. Um, I will say, I forgot to put a slide in here. Um, all of the materials are posted, uh, these draft materials that we're presenting are posted under today's board meeting. Um, you, so we tried as best we could to have the slides be an overview of all the changes, but obviously the full document, or the full draft um, <clears throat> proposals on the website, if people wanna look at individual questions prior to next week, um, that is, is posted. Um, a reminder of the timeline, um, we are at June 15th, the 
certification form and certified ACL budget guidance pres presentation. Um, we've noticed a potential vote for next week if the board is ready to vote and accept on the guidance. <coughs> A special public comment period is open until June 20th. Um, we have received a couple of public comments on last week's presentation, um, Medicare only. So we will include kind of a, a comment about the public comment that's been received um, next week prior to the vote so that you um, know what that is. But I believe that's been posted and board members have received that comment. So that concludes our presentation. I'm gonna pause another drink and um, put, send it back to you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Marissa. I'll open it up to the board for comments or questions. I'll go ahead and just jump in. I look forward to, of course, hearing uh, whatever public comment we get today and during the open period, but uh, I like the idea of including um, the VBIF requirement in as guidance because I think that that's a very important component to the program, and I think it's it's you know last year I think we we looked at some of the proposed changes and and wanted to make sure that it remained a robust component. So I think having that up front so to set the expectation is good. And uh, it makes good sense that if it's something that we're putting in the budget order every year, we just go ahead and put it in the guidance like the uh, commercial uh, trend language. So I just thought I'd chime in that those are my preliminary thoughts on those two, but subject of course to hearing public comment and thinking about it for a week. Thank you, Robin. Other board members? Sure, I'll I'll chop in here. Um, first of all, I want to appreciate say how much I appreciate all the hard work that's been done. Clearly, a lot of work here, especially the attempts to streamline the guidance and reduce duplication and clarify questions. And I'm um, happy to hear you know moving finally towards adaptive submissions. I think that is going to be really helpful. And I do uh, you know I have to think more about it, but I do appreciate and and like the uh, proposed budget targets, uh, adding them in now. Uh, a couple of um, thoughts to add. Um, section 7, I would love to see um, an expanded definition of, of health equity consistent with the conversation we had last week with the Medicare only guidance. Um, there's a reference in here to race and ethnicity data, um, which I think is really important. I guess I would maybe you can play with the language a little bit to make it consistent with the Medicare only guidance where there's a more expansive view of you know, potential health disparities inclusive of sexual orientation, identity, disability, virality, other other opportunities to understand um, health equity. Um, so that was in section seven. And then uh, a minor adjustment, proposed adjustment to consider uh, in section five. Let me just pull up the exact question. Uh, it's section five, question six which is discussing the ACO's total cost of care accountability strategy at the HSA level. Um, in part B, it says, how is the ACO helping hospitals and other community providers to reduce low value care and lower their total cost of care at the local HSA level? I'd actually like to add um, in front of low value care, I'd also like to add avoidable utilization um, to that question and then add a second sentence to that question, which is please add specific examples and where possible quantify the ACO's direct impact on reducing avoidable utilization, low value care and lowering total cost of care at the HSA level. Um, and I guess, you know, what I'm trying to get at there is that I want to hear, um, I don't want to just hear about how they're doing it. I want to hear about the impact of the, of the work that they're doing. And so I want to, you know, specific examples where we can see a direct impact of that work and to the degree that they can quantify, identify, you know, cost savings from their, um, from their efforts or reductions in low value care or reductions in avoidable utilization, things like that. So, 
I'm happy to send language to you, Marissa, later, if, you know, but hopefully if that makes sense, what I've just described, I'd like to see a little more depth in those questions. But other than that, I uh, just want to say I really appreciate again all the hard work here. I think we're making progress every year in improving our guidance. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, my comment is on part two and the not including the um, some specifics as uh, it pertains to a budget target for commercial. Um, I think that's a fatal flaw in this, um, in my opinion, that we're five years down the road um, in healthcare with the all para model, and uh, we have less than one and a half to two percent of uh, <clears throat> commercial payments in the form of fixed perspective payments, clearly understanding that there are some defini definitional issues here. But even back in Mike Smith's implementation improvement plan of a couple of years ago, uh, it was emphasized that this is an arena that needs some work. And I do think it's time for an intervention uh, in this area that we have um, you know, the, the largest payer in the state um, and they are they are effusive in their praise for uh, health care reform and value based payments. Yet um, when the rubber hit the road, <laughs> that they don't show up. And uh, and I sometimes wonder, I look at the rate increases that the commercials are requesting for 2023. And we just wonder what those might be if we'd had fixed prospect of payments in that arena two years ago. So um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not prone to avoid that issue because we don't have enough data or there, there are a couple of reasons, uh, um, the reasons that you mentioned. I just think that we're far down the road here. There's a lot of water um, <clears throat> under the bridge. We should be farther down the road. I mean, and when you have positive reports like the Nor NORAC report on savings in Medicare and you have uh, Diva happy with the um, uh, implementation of, of their uh, unreconciled fixed perspective payments. I just think, uh, um, and, and you have the heads, corporate heads of uh, at least one of them, and I've read it before, I won't read it again, praising uh, value-based um, payments, and we just kick the can down the road, and uh, that's not a place I want to be in. But you know, uh, there's a lot of great work in this uh, presentation, a lot of simplification and clarity, but that to me is a foundational flaw that we as a regulator are not, after four or five years of healthcare reform, we are not putting the heat on the carriers um, and and urging um, one care, which it has an intermediary position between uh, payers and providers, asking them at least to, to uh, push this ball down the court. Um, they can't make it happen, uh, but but they can be aggressive and, and we can ask them to come back to us and tell us why, why they have been successful, if they are successful in engaging the commercials or to tell us why they, that, what are the barriers that, um, you know, that in, in, inhibit this engagement. But I, I, I just, I, I, I think, you know, more kind of process and reporting and things of that sort. Um, and then you look at the 12 and 16% rate increases that are being, you know, asked, um, not that uh, fixed prospective payments would solve all of that, but um, that that is a piece of the puzzle that we've said all along is fundamental toward uh, affordability, which is uh, fixed prospective payments. And we have basically mouse meat um, in that regard when it comes about, you know, to the to the uh, commercial carriers, but we'll we'll talk about this more in the two by two. Yes, and, and I can respond to that too now, if that's okay. I um, I I hear you and I agree with you, and I wanted to do this for you um, and and for the <laughs> for the project, but um, I found that um, if we can't um, one, we're going to con we are continuing to ask them the questions that you raise and get the reporting. So that's not going to go away um, and and put pressure on through the through the through the um, through the process. 
um, the, you know, and talk about what limit, what the limitations are and the barriers and, and such. So we can still continue to do all that. What I didn't feel that we could do is set a target that we can't, that we really have no way of, um, of enforcing. I mean, that target that one care has proposed is still out there. We still know what it is. We still know it's not being met. So I think the pressure is still there. Um, it just didn't feel like, um, it was something that we were comfortable sort of setting a target that can't really have any teeth. So that's the, that's the difference. I'm not letting up on asking these questions and having those conversations, um, as part of the process, if that helps at all. But yes, we can certainly talk about it more before next week. Well, I, I know, and we don't believe this much more now, but I, I know that there are differences in the FTPs uh, uh, that, that um, we engage with Medicare and those that we engage with Medicaid, but somewhere between 0% essentially and the 23.9%, there, there is a marker that the private carriers can achieve, especially given their publicly expressed um, abusiveness about health care reform and value-based payments. Um, and we've had, we're in our fifth year of the all-payer model, and we're, we're literally down, uh, according to the ACO's documents, you know, to less than $100,000 in fixed prospective payments aligned with the private carriers. And that, that just, to me, is unacceptable. Okay, is there other board comments or questions? Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comments on the ACO budget guidance? And I'll go first to Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I just, <clears throat> Tom Pelham took most of my questions, which is a good thing, so I'll let Tom stand. My only other comment here, along with what Tom Pelham said, is why does everything have to be so complicated about American healthcare? I mean, I've been listening to this for hours, for a whole presentation, and I don't think a NASA engineer could understand half of it. Okay, thank you, Walter. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing and seeing none, I want to thank Marissa and Michelle and Julia for the presentation today. And uh, Marissa, if you could just uh, remind us of the timeline. Yes, yeah, so we've set a potential vote for next week. Um, we'd like to receive any written comments by the 20th so that we have uh, well, a quick turnaround to incorporate that. Um, if the board's ready to vote next week, we can do so. There sounds like there's a few minor changes or anything else we identify. Um, we will let you know what that is prior to the vote. Oh, and then that needs to be issued to um, the ACOs um, by July one. So we then prepare the documents um, if they need to be prepared in any way and post them um, by the end of the month. So we'll we'll do it earlier if um, they're ready to go. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So we're going to change gears now and we're going to have an overview of the 2022 legislative session. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Christina McLaughlin. Christina. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we, as Kevin said, are switching to... I can barely hear you, Christina. Oh, okay. I'll speak up. Is that better? Yes, much. Okay. All right. I'm in the office, so I'm trying not to be too loud for other <laughs> folks. Uh, so as uh, Chair Mullen said, we are switching over to the 2022 legislative session. This is just a brief presentation of the bills uh, that were um, moved through the session and actually enacted all of them uh, that we were tracking relating to our healthcare system uh, and the Green Mountain Care Board uh, directly as well. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and I'll ask soon to, to see if you can actually see it on your screen. 
OK. Let me know if that's popped up because now I can't see all of you. So it looks like it's yeah. trying. OK, I'll give it another minute. Can anybody else see it? I see just nodding. So I, I must be the last one to be getting the PowerPoints lately, but <laughs> I still it's have just... the, the, the CM circle, but that's OK. okay. Go ahead. OK, uh, like I said, I know it was a packed agenda, so I kept this very brief. Um, so starting on the uh, first slide, slide number two, um, we are looking at the list of bills, House and Senate bills that I'll be reviewing. I definitely focus on the highlights here. I wanted to keep this short and concise uh, for everyone. Um, and at the end of the slide deck, you'll see a link to the General Assembly website. So if you want more information on these bills um, to read the full bills or the act summaries, um, they are available on the website. Um, but I wanted to hit the highlights here, um, focusing, like I said, on the healthcare system and the Green Mountain Care Board's work. Uh, I did not uh, add the budget language or anything from the big budget bill, uh, Act 185. Um, uh, we could have gone a whole rabbit hole down there, but that did include uh, healthcare workforce uh, appropriations for the healthcare workforce and other healthcare related items. So I just wanted to flag that. So moving to slide three, uh, this is uh, Act 85, an act extending COVID-19 flexibilities. Uh, this uh, act um, extends certain COVID-19 related healthcare uh, regulatory flexibility provisions through March 31st of next year. These flexibilities were first enacted in Act 91 of 2020 and then were extended previously in Act 140 of 2020 uh, and Act 6 of 2021. Uh, wanted to flag this since it does include the board's regulatory processes in this bill. Uh, it also directs the board to consider the hospital's labor costs and investments, as well as the impacts of these costs on invest and investments on the affordability of health care. This relates to any hospital budget uh, proceeding conducted on or after February 1st of this year to establish or enforce a hospital FY 22 or 23 budget. It also created a registration process to allow out of state healthcare professionals to deliver care to patients in Vermont using telehealth. Uh, from April of this year through June 30th of next year. So moving on to slide four. Uh, this is uh, Act 108, uh, an act relating to coverage for hearing aids. Uh, just some background here. Um, the purpose of the bill uh, is outlined in the beginning of this act. Um, and uh, the General Assembly noted that they recognize the negative health outcomes associated with untreated hearing loss. Uh, and also notes the intention to support access to hearing aids and related services and ensure continued coverage of hearing aids and services in Vermont. Uh, this uh, bill also notes that the board approved this past March the recommendation from the Department of Vermont Health Access, also known as DIVA, to add coverage to Vermont's essential health benefit benchmark plan for one hearing aid per year every three years and an annual exam starting 2024. So going into the expanding coverage of hearing aids, this directs DIVA and DFR, Department of Financial Regulation, to provide an update on uh, to the Health Reform Oversight Committee, also known as HROC, regarding the state's application to the federal agencies to modify the essential health benefit, uh, health, essential health benefits in the benchmark plan on or before November 1st of this year. Uh, it also ensures Medicaid uh, continues coverage for medically necessary hearing aids and audiology services and outlines the coverage requirement for hearing aids and related services for large group plans, which will take effect January 1 of 2024. So moving to slide five, we are now on Act 107, an act relating to telehealth licensure, a licensure registration system. This creates a licensure and registration system for telehealth. Uh, this allows a healthcare professional who is not otherwise licensed, certified, or registered in Vermont, but is in good standing in any other U.S. jurisdiction to obtain a, t a telehealth license or registration to provide services to a patient located in Vermont using telehealth. These licenses uh, would be administered uh, by the Office of Professional Regulation or the Board of Medical Practice uh, and outlines the number of patients a healthcare professional is allowed to deliver care to during the license terms. 
Uh, the bill also notes healthcare professionals uh, con continue to have the option to pursue a full license to practice uh, if they wish to do so. Moving to slide uh, six, we are now on Act uh, 119, Patient Financial Policies and Medical Debt Protection. Uh, this creates um, or really directs large healthcare facilities to develop a written financial assistance policy that at a minimum complies with the provisions outlined in this act and any applicable federal requirements. Uh, the policy has to apply to all emergency and other medically necessary services that the large facility offers and provide discounted care to Vermont residents and to individuals who live in Vermont at the time services are delivered but may lack stable permanent housing. Uh, qualifications for free or discounted care um, are based on household income at or below a percentage of FPL. The bill clearly outlines those uh, percentages. Um, and then moving on to implementation of this, um, the facility has to take steps uh, before seeking payment. Um, so before uh, asking for a payment, they uh, have to determine whether the, pa the patient has health insurance or other coverage and also provide patients with information on how to apply for public programs if uninsured and how to apply for health insurance and private programs. On to slide seven, continuing with this, with Act 119, uh, there's a section on public education and information. Uh, the healthcare facilities have to publicize financial uh, assistance policies widely um, so that folks are aware of these policies. Uh, there's also um, with enforcement, the Office of the Attorney General in Vermont has the authority to make rules, conduct civil investigations, enter into assurances of discontinuance, and bring civil actions for any violations. Uh, and then uh, the bill includes a few other things, including um, that the hospitals uh, or facilities have to submit a plain language summary of its financial assistance policy to the board during the hospital FY25 budget review process. It also doesn't allow the facilities to sell medical debt and that all facilities must comply no later than July 1st of 2024. Moving on to Act 131, which is an act relating to pharmacy benefit management. This bill was very comprehensive and I definitely hit the highlights here. So I recommend uh, taking a look at the bill further if you're interested um, in getting more into the details. Uh, but section one um, actually outlined the intent to increase access to needed medications by making prescription drugs more affordable and accessible by increasing state regulation of PBMs and, uh, sorry, of pharmacy benefit managers and pharmacy benefit management. Uh, so the bill directs the Department of Financial Regulation to monitor the cost impacts of PBM regulation and recommended changes as needed to promote healthcare affordability and also consider issues including PBM licensure, spread to pricing, pharmacist dispensing fees, and with the Board of Pharmacy issues regarding pharmacist scope of practice. Uh, DFR then has to report these findings and recommendations jan uh, by January 15th of 2023. So as you could imagine, this bill prohibits uh, PBMs from doing quite a few things, uh, including restricting the information pharmacies and pharmacists can provide to the Department of Financial Regulation, law enforcement or state or federal government officials. It also prohibits discriminating against 340B covered entities and extends an existing prohibition on PBMs imposing certain requirements on pharmacies related to 340B drugs, uh, prohibits reimbursing pharmacies and pharmacists in Vermont less uh, than they would reimburse PBM affili affiliates for the same services, and requires, uh, prohibits from requiring covered persons to use mail order pharmacies or PBM affiliates or from increasing out-of-pocket costs when a covered person does not use mail order pharmacy or a PBM affiliate. Continuing with Act 131, uh, it also expands prohibitions on gag clauses and PBM contracts with pharmacies and pharmacists. Uh, it provides additional rights to pharmacies during a P PBM audit, and there's a section on white and brown bagging. It prohibits health insurers and PBMs from requiring that a pharmacy dispense a medication directly to a patient for the patient to bring to the provider's office to be administered there, which is brown bagging, or that a pharmacy dispense medication directly to a provider's office to be administered to the patient in the provider's office, also known as white bagging. Moving on to slide 10, we're now on Act 137, which is an act relating to miscellaneous provisions affecting health insurance regulation. 
Uh, this is a much larger bill, but we're hitting the highlights that relate to this presentation. Uh, so it includes language on the No Surprises Act. Um, it requires health insurance insurers and healthcare providers to comply with the requirements of the federal No Surprises Act and directs DFR to enforce those requirements and collaborate with other stakeholders to inform the providers of their responsibilities under the federal act. Uh, DFR is allowed to refer cases of non-compliance to the federal government or to the Office of the Vermont Attorney General. There's also language relating to the individual and small group markets. Uh, it unmerged um, or continued to keep the markets unmerged uh, for plan year 2023. And also DFR in consultation with the board is to convene a working group to look at into maintaining separate, also known as unmerged markets, in a manner that reduces premiums in the small group market without increasing costs in the individual market. These findings and recommendations are due to the legislature on or before January 15th of 2023. Moving on to slide 11, we are now on uh, now moving on to the Senate bills. So Act 183 was an act relating to economic and workforce development. Uh, as you can imagine, this uh, provided a lot of appropriations to uh, support workforce and economic development, including healthcare workforce. Uh, you'll notice many of the healthcare workforce sections are focused on nursing and starting with uh, the first one here, emergency grants to nurse educators. Two million was appropriated to the Department of Health to provide emergency interim grants to Vermont nursing schools over three years with equal amounts distributed in the fiscal years 2023, 2024, and 2025. There's also funds appropriated to nurse preceptor grants and there's a report uh, $400,000 uh, appropriated from the general fund to AHS and FY23 to provide incentive grants to hospital employed nurses in Vermont to serve as preceptors for students enrolled in Vermont nursing school programs. It also uh, directs the director of healthcare reform to convene a working group to identify ways to increase placement opportunities and provide a report based on those findings. There's also funds uh, 2.5 million uh, to the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, also known as VSAC, in FY23 to provide grants to healthcare employers to establish or expand partnerships with Vermont nursing schools to create nursing pipeline or apprenticeship programs. Sticking with Act 183, we're now on slide 12. Uh, there are funds appropriated to the Department of Health to establish a Vermont Nursing Forgivable Loan Program, which provides scholarships for nursing students. Recipients agree to work as a nurse in Vermont for a minimum of one year. Uh, there's also a nursing and physician assistant loan repayment, 2.5 million in general fund dollars to the Department of Health to establish and administer a loan repayment program for nurses and physician assistants in coordination with VSAC. And there's a nurse faculty for forgivable loan program, uh, half a million dollars uh, to the Department of Health to create and administer a program to offer forgivable loans to nurse faculty members at a Vermont nursing school. And for each year of service at a nursing school in Vermont, an eligible individual receives a full academic year of forgivable loan benefit. Sticking with Act 183 again, there is a nurse faculty loan repayment program. Uh, this is funds appropriated to Department of Health to provide loan repayment on behalf of eligible nurse faculty members. The amount recipients can receive is equal to the value of one academic year of loans for every year of service as a member of the nurse faculty at a nursing school in Vermont. There's also 1.5 million to the Department of Health to provide forgivable loans to eligible mental health professionals. This is available to students enrolled in a master's program at an eligible school who commit to working as a mental health professional in Vermont. And 1.25 million to AHS uh, to be distributed to the designated specialized services agencies for loan repayment and tuition assistance for recruitment and retention of high quality mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals. Slide 14 now, keeping with Act 183, there's also uh, language relating to the board's hospital budget review. So the board is directed to, re uh, to review hospital investments in workforce development initiatives, including nursing workforce pipeline collaborations with nursing schools and compensation and other support for nurse preceptors. Uh, also uh, asked to consider the salaries for the hospital's executive and clinical leadership and the hospital's salary spread, including a comparison of median salaries to the medians of northern New England states. And uh, the board may exclude all or a portion of a hospital's investments in nursing workforce development initiatives 
from an otherwise applicable financial limitation to the hospital's budget or budget growth. And then finally, there is uh, there are funds for a healthcare workforce data center. Uh, there's uh, $750,000 appropriated to AHS to establish and operate a statewide healthcare workforce data center. This includes a, a position in AHS, um, the healthcare workforce data center manager, uh, to manage the healthcare workforce data center created. And then there's another position created, the healthcare workforce coordinator. There are funds ap appropriated. Uh, for one classified three-year position in AHS, also no, known as the Healthcare Workforce Coordinator. This coordinator is specifically focused on building educational, clinical, and housing partnerships and support structures to increase and improve healthcare workforce training, recruitment, and retention in the state of Vermont. So last but not least, we are on Act 167, which is an act uh, related to healthcare reform initiatives data collection and access to home and community-based services. Uh, this bill uh, includes language um, on the subsequent APM agreement, all-payer model agreement. This directs the Director of Healthcare Reform in collaboration with the board to develop a proposal for a subsequent agreement with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, they must include the consideration of alternative payment and delivery system approach approaches for hospital services and community-based providers, such as primary care providers, mental health providers, substance use disorder treatment providers, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, and providers of long-term care services and supports. The process for developing the proposal includes uh, opportunities for meaningful participation by the full continuum of healthcare and social service providers, payers, participants in the healthcare system, and other interested stakeholders. It's definitely a long list of folks involved. And then the board uh, is to collaborate with AHS and stakeholders to build on successful healthcare delivery system reform efforts by developing value-based payments, including global payments from all payers to Vermont hospitals or ACOs or both. There are a couple reporting requirements related to this. Uh, on or before January 15th of 2023, the Director of Healthcare Reform and the Board is to report on their activities. And on or before March 15th of 2023, the Director of Healthcare Reform is to provide an update regarding the agency stakeholder engagement process to the legislature. Now on slide 17, continuing with Act 167, uh, there is a section focused on hospital system transformation and stakeholder engagement. So the board, in collaboration with the Director of Healthcare Reform over at AHS, is to develop and conduct a data-informed, patient-focused, community-inclusive engagement process for Vermont's hospitals to reduce inefficiencies, lower costs, and improve population health comes, outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services while maintaining su sufficient capacity for emergency management. Uh, the out, it outlines the requirements for the engagement process, including that it is conducted by the Director of Healthcare Reform, and then on or before January 15th of next year, the board is to provide an update on the community engagement piece. And then on slide 18, uh, keeping with Act 167, uh, there's a section on the HIE Health Information Exchange Steering Committee. Uh, the committee is to include a data integration strategy and the HIE strategic plan to merge claims and clinical data. There's also a section relating to the healthcare database. Uh, existing law uh, limited the ability to analyze clinical data and claims together, resulting in potentially duplicative data collection and limited the use for delivery system reform. So the change in this bill allows the board to bring data together at a patient level. There's also a section directing the board to summarize key findings and recommendations from reports by and for the board. And then lastly, uh, with Act, keeping with Act 167, uh, there is a section on prior authorization. It directs DFR to explore the feasibility of requiring insurers and their prior auth vendors to access clinical data from the Vermont Health Information Exchange whenever possible to support prior auth requests in situations in which a request can't be automatically approved. And the DFR is to uh, create a report. Uh, first, DFR is to direct health insurers to provide prior auth information in a certain format to enable the department to analyze opportunities to align and streamline prior auth proce request processes, and then share its findings and recommendations with the board. And then the board and uh, DFR is to uh, collaborate to provide recommendations 
to the legislature on or before January 15th of 2023 regarding the statutory changes necessary to align and streamline prior auth processes and requirements across health insurers. Uh, Act 167 also includes sections related to the blueprint for health, options for extending moderate need supports, and Medicaid reimbursement. And then on to the question slide. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Chair Mullen. Thank you, questions. Christina. Very informative. Um, we'll start with the board members' questions or comments. I don't have um, a question, but I did have a comment. Christine, I think there's a correction needed on slide 17 okay. um, because the, the engagement that's led by the director of healthcare reform is the all pair model engagement. So oh, we should you. make sure that that's a little clearer there. Thank you. I'll there's that two different me. engagements in that bill. So yes, it's yes, there's a lot of engagement. Yes, I'll make that update and uh, repost. Thank you. OK, any questions for Christina or comments from the board? Good job summarizing a lot of information there, Christina. <laughs> Trying to keep a high level for, for everyone's sake. Chair Mullen, can I just thank Christina for following all of this legislation throughout the session? Of course, we know it's your job, but you did a really great job in following so much. I know there's a lot of people on this line who were uh, busy as well following all of the legislation and informing us, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment? It's the benefit of going last, Christina. <laughs> Everyone's tired. <laughs> they want to get yeah. outside. Nice job, Christina. <laughs> thank you, Walter. OK, well, thank you very much. And is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>